I'm Joseph Gerson. I'm Director of Programs for the American Friends Service Committee's Northeast Region. I'm also the convener of the Working Group for Peace and Demilitarization in Asia and the Pacific. This is a talk that I gave at the Pivoting for Peace Conference in Cambridge and then gave about a month later at the Facing the Dangers of Great Power War Conference in New York, as well as at the peace event in Sarajevo in uh, May of 2014. I'll begin with a slide that shows the number of parallels that we face between now in East Asia and the Pacific and the era that preceded World War I, uh, which might better be understood as the European Great Power War. We are again in a period of rising and declining powers, arms races with new technologies, resurgent nationalism, territorial disputes, resource competition, complex alliance arrangements, economic integration and competition, and wild cards, especially the Abe government in Japan and the North Korean government. The situation in East Asia needs to be understood in these terms. As you know, President Obama just completed a four-nation tour to show the U.S. will and its resolve to implement the so-called pivot to Asia and the Pacific, otherwise known as the rebalancing of U.S. foreign and military policies. In President Obama's meetings with Japanese Prime Minister Abe, he said that the disputed Senkaku Dayu Islands fall within the U.S.-Japan alliance, and that the U.S. would back Japan if it came to a war between Japan and China over these uninhabited rocks. Obama also encouraged Japan's right-wing prime minister to proceed with revising the reinterpretation of Japan's constitution, which is to say to inviserate Article 9, the foundation of Japan's ostensible post-war pacifism. Obama also reaffirmed U.S. insistence that a major new U.S. air base be built in Okinawa, where 75% of the more than 100 U.S. military bases and installations in Japan are concentrated. He's doing this despite the overwhelming opposition of the Okinawa people. The two leaders also consulted on the development of a new U.S.-Japan defense guidelines, uh, which is to say their military planning. And they agreed that Japan would restart many of its nuclear power plants despite the Fukushima uh, catastrophe. Japan is to join with the U.S. in promoting the export of nuclear power plants as part of the U.S.-Japanese nuclear alliance. People should appreciate that deep historical wounds persist between Japan and Korea, in large measure because the Japanese government has yet to fully accept its responsibilities for the 35 years of really brutal colonization and occupation of Korea. Until recently, Prime Minister Abe even threatened to revisit Japan's official apology for the sexual slavery pa practiced during what was Japan's 15-year war in Asia and the Pacific, what we call the Pacific Theater of World War II. A few weeks ago in The Hague, President Obama brought Japan's and South Korea's presidents together after they had refused to meet with one another for more than a year. They didn't exactly have deep or warm conversations, but the brief event opened the way for their two militaries to resume discussions about military collaboration, especially intelligence sharing focused on North Korea and China. To underline the potential dangers of the current situation in East Asia, let me point to several recent developments. In March of last year, with B-52 and B-2 bombers, the U.S. flew simulated nuclear attacks against North Korea, actions that could have all too easily resulted in calamitous miscalculations by Kim Jong-un's government. Again, shortly after China declared the new air, uh, air defense identification zone that overlaps with Japan's ADIZ, uh, the U.S. again sent B-52 bombers unannounced through the zone. And during President Obama's recent trip to Asia, he flew through the zone unannounced as a powerful signal to Beijing. These are the Senkaku Dayu uninhabited islands, which could serve as the trigger for the end of humanity. In both real and symbolic terms, they are the focus of J Japanese and Chinese geopolitical and resource competition. The U.S. is not the only provocative actor in the region. China has claimed sovereignty over 80% of the South China Sea, whose mineral-rich seabeds are thought to hold massive amounts of oil and natural gas. The South China Sea is also critically important for moving the Middle Eastern and Persian Gulf oil that is essential for China's economy and for the economies of other East Asian nations. To reinforce its claims, China has sent warships as far as the waters off Malaysia, and it has occupied the Scarborough Shoal, long thought to be within the Philippine territorial waters. Another way to understand current developments is to think about what was discussed when Chinese leader Xi Jinping uh, 
met with the President of the European Council, Herman Rompuy. In 2010, the U.S. National Intelligence Council, the ultimate U.S. intelligence arbiter, described what is happening in its Global Trends 2025 report. It said, The transfer of global wealth and economic power now underway, roughly from west to east, is without precedent in modern history and is a primary factor in the decline of the United States' relative strength, even in the military realm. Deconstructing this, they are saying that there are parallels to 500 years ago when Europe conquered the Americas, whose gold and silver financed European colonization of much of the world and the Industrial Revolution. Joe Nye is an interesting figure. He served as Deputy Secretary of Defense under President Clinton, and he has long been one of the primary authors of U.S. Asia-Pacific policy. For many years, with China in mind, Nye has been warning of the dangers of rising and declining powers. Twice in the 20th century, he explains, the dominant powers, the United States and Britain, failed to integrate rising powers, Germany and Japan, into their systems, resulting in catastrophic world wars. Nye has therefore pressed engagement as well as containment with China. Just before Hillary Clinton promulgated the pivot to Asia and the Pacific, in a New York Times article, Nye outlined its rationale. He wrote, and I quote, Asia will return to its historic status with more than half of the world's population and half of the world's economic output. America must be present there. Markets and economic power rest on political frameworks, and American military power provides that framework. A bold statement that the U.S. military is the foundation of East Asia's economic and political order. Kirk Campbell was Assistant Secretary for East Asian Affairs during Obama's first administration, and he explained this a little differently. He announced, again quoting, It will be important for China to accept that the United States is going to plan an enduring strong role in the Asia-Pacific region, but that the United States does want stronger, deeper relationships with China, and we have made that undeniably clear. The U.S.-China relationship is best described as competitive interdependence. The U.S. is trying to manage China's rise, but there is a danger that miscalculations could trigger a catastrophic war. The Pentagon is telling us that China's military is increasingly potent. It has an aircraft carrier, albeit built in Ukraine and long used as a floating hotel, and it has a growing naval capacity. China is developing missiles designed to destroy U.S. aircraft carriers, and it is building its next generation of warplanes. Anyone who reads the newspaper knows that China is competing with the U.S. in cyber warfare capabilities, and there is an arms race in space as China deploys advanced satellite information and warfare technologies. However, Robert Kaplan, who is anything but a liberal or a pacifist, reports that China, quote, is developing asymmetric and anti-access niche capabilities, which are designed to deny the U.S. Navy easy entry into the East China Sea and other coastal waters. China, he wrote, is not remotely capable of directly challenging the U.S. military. The aim is dissuasion, that the U.S. Navy in the future will think twice as China's military expands and three times about getting between the first island chain and the Chinese coast. To appreciate China's perceptions and approach, try to project yourself into the mindsets of people who suffered 150 years of humiliation, beginning with the invasions from their coasts by Britain and other European powers, the United States and Japan. As they restore what was long China's historic role, the last thing they want is to be threatened by Japan or by any other power. You also have Armitage and Nye, a Republican and a Democrat, who reflect the United States' consistently bipartisan approach to Asia and the Pacific. They drafted a report just before Prime Minister Abe came to power in which they addressed what had been a period of Japanese economic stagnation and drift in U.S.-Chinese relations. Their report included a direct challenge to Tokyo. Will the drift continue, or will Japan remain a first-tier nation? When Abe came to the United States to meet with Obama shortly after becoming prime minister, he gave a direct response, saying that Japan will indeed remain a first-tier nation, using Armitage and Nye's exact formulation. To appreciate the import of this exchange, remember that since it came into being in 1952, the U.S.-Japan military alliance has pretty much had the same role in Asia that NATO has had in Europe. With more than 100 U.S. military bases and installations across Japan, 
The alliance has been and remains the foundation of U.S. regional domination. As former Prime Minister Koizumi described his nation, Japan is, quote, an unsinkable aircraft carrier for the United States. Let me say a few more words about Prime Minister Abe. There is a misapprehension that Japan is a pacifist state. It is currently the world's sixth biggest military spender, and it has a navy and air force thought to be more advanced than China's. Abe is about to reinterpret the Constitution, and he has denied that, uh, what took place during Japan's 15-year war, 1931 to 1945, was aggression. Just last week, 150 members of Japan's parliament went to Yasukuni Shrine, where the spirits of Japanese Class A war criminals are enshrined. The visit was a symbolic recommitment to Japanese militarism. Abe is looking to increase military spending, and he denies the existence of territorial disputes with China and Korea. Until recently, he threatened to revisit Japan's official apology for wartime sexual slavery, a new state secrets law more repressive than that of any other ostensibly advanced democratic nation has been adopted, and Abe has made unprecedented moves to control information. The military Shintoist worldviews of people he has appointed to lead the NHK, Japan's equivalent of NPR and PBS combined, are reminiscent of those that prevailed in Japan in the 1930s and 40s. Looking again to U.S. policies, the U.S. has committed to deploy 60% of its air force and 60% of its naval forces to Asia and the Pacific. As Michael Clare put it, Obama is sending a clear message to Beijing. We are becoming less dependent on imported oil, so we enjoy a stronger hand in international relations. You, China, are becoming more reliant on imports and are in the unfortunate position of having to rely solely on supply routes that are controlled by the U.S. Navy. This is not unlike the period during the Cold War when the U.S. controlled the Middle East and Persian Gulf jugular veins of the global economy, Middle East oil. The U.S. can now control the jugular vein of China's and other East Asians' economies. All of this has deep historic roots. In the 1850s, William Seward, later U.S. Secretary of State, argued that if the U.S. was to replace Britain as the world's leading power, it needed first to control Asia. At the time, the southern route, the coaling stations on Pacific islands like Hawaii, Guam, and the Philippines, were occupied by other colonial powers from Europe which explains Seward's folly. He bought Alaska to gain the northern access route to Asia. It wasn't until the 1890s, when the U.S. had built the naval fleet capable of competing with Britain for naval supremacy, and U.S. leaders were desperate to conquer a portion of the China market to keep U.S. factories operating during a great economic depression, that the Spanish-American War provided the occasion to conquer, annex, and establish the geopolitical foundation of the U.S. overseas empire, Guam, the Philippines, and Hawaii. With the end of World War II, the Pacific Ocean became an American lake, and during the military occupation of Japan, about which most people in the U.S. know very little, the U.S. created the new Japanese government in order to reflect its geopolitical ambitions. Many of Japan's leaders were people like Nobusuke Kishi, Prime Minister Abe's grandfather, who played major roles in Japan's wartime government. The U.S. nurtured Kishi, who had initially charged as a Class A war criminal, helping him to become prime minister. It was Kishi in 1960 who, in the face of massive street demonstrations and brawling Japanese parliamentarians, undemocratically hammered through the extension of the U.S.-Japan alliance. The alliance had been secretly imposed on Japan in 1952 as the term and condition for ending the formal U.S. occupation of the conquered country. In the U.S., international disarmament movements and the world at large, people tend to think that the last time nuclear weapons were used was the A-bombing of Nagasaki in August 1945. Would that that were true? In fact, on more than 30 occasions during international crises and wars, the U.S., often in secret, has threatened or prepared to initiate nuclear attacks. During the Cold War, most people thought that the nuclear threat applied only to the U.S. and the Soviet Union. But in Asia, such threats and preparations have been made at least ten times against North Korea, four times against Vietnam, and at least four times against China. In January 2011, Hillary Clinton announced the pivot in a widely trumpeted article published in Foreign Policy magazine. She began her article saying, As war in Iraq winds down and America begins to withdraw its forces from Afghanistan, the United States stands at a pivot point 
One of the most important tasks over the next decade will be to lock in a substantially increased investment, diplomatic, economic, strategic, and otherwise, in the Asia-Pacific region. This is the South China Sea, portions of which have other names, reflecting the competing claims of the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia. The region that China claims falls within what Beijing calls the nine-dotted or dashed line, which you see here. Compounding the territorial competition, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton announced that the South China Sea is also an area of U.S. vital interest because of its role in international shipping. This transformed the dispute into one between the great powers, reducing the possibility of the nations most involved negotiating a compromise that would serve their common interests. Here you see the inner island chain and the region contested by Japan and China. If you go to China, you will certainly be exposed to a lot of anti-Japanese propaganda, some of it quite legitimate, but it is also designed to reinforce Chinese nationalism and thus to reinforce Chinese political stability. Here you see the location of the Senkaku Dayu Islands. They are to the west of Okinawa and not far from Taiwan. The tensions of the last couple of years over these uninhabited rocks was initiated by extreme right-wing forces in Japan, and since then the two nations have broadcast their historical claims, with each nation taking out old historical documents to prove that the islands are theirs. It is an extraordinary human tragedy that we'd face the possibility of human extinction in a contest over these outcroppings. This is a picture of the possible trigger for World War III. What you see are Japanese and Chinese warships and Taiwanese fishing vessels in extremely dangerous proximity. It is about impossible to tell which is which. The possibility of an incident occurring, possibly a crash in the sinking of one of these ships, is all too real. At a seminar at Harvard a couple of months ago, Ezra Vogel, who served as the head of Asian intelligence at the State Department under President Clinton, pointed to this picture and said that in the case of an incident, there could be no confidence that military escalation could be capped. The power of nationalism in Japan and China is intense, and now the Abe government has President Obama's support as wind behind his sails. So it is all too easy to imagine a situation in which there is an incident. One country responds by launching drones, the other shoots down a drone, further inflaming national pride. Then warplanes engage in dogfights, resulting in further escalation and possibly a U.S.-Chinese military confrontation. How dangerous is this? Remember that in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy told his brother that if he didn't threaten China with nuclear attack, Congress would impeach him. The pressures of nationalism in Japan and China today are probably more powerful than those that drove the Kennedys five decades ago, or that Bush and Cheney exploited after 9-11. And of course, the danger of nuclear war continues to grow out of continuing North and South Korean tensions. The two nations frequently exchange artillery fire, and miscalculations are all too possible. Central to the pivot is the U.S. campaign to reinforce its alliances and to add additional military bases to encircle China, something China experiences as a great wall in reverse. The alliances with Japan and South Korea, now termed global alliances, are essential to this strategy. While deeply integrated into U.S. war planning, the Abe government is also hedging against the possibility that in a future crisis with China, the United States might not be there to back it up. So in ways that reinforce and parallel the U.S. encirclement of China, Japan is also building military and economic cooperation with many ASEAN nations in India. The U.S. military alliance with South Korea is now described as a global military alliance. When President Obama was in Manila, he signed an agreement which functionally creates a new U.S. military base there in violation of the Philippine Constitution. In fact, U.S. forces returned to the Philippines under the unequally unconstitutional visiting forces agreement. Guam is termed the tip of the U.S. spear. It's a classical case of cowboys and Indians all over again. More than a quarter of the island nation has long been occupied by U.S. military bases, and against the day when the people of Okinawa finally freed themselves from the U.S. military occupation, the Pentagon is planning to massively expand its naval and air bases in Guam in ways that will further jeopardize the survival of the Chamorro people and their civilization.
Elsewhere, the U.S. has close military cooperation with Singapore and increasingly with Vietnam, where U.S. warships have returned to Cameron Bay and the two nations engage in joint military exercises. Military-to-military relations have been renewed with Indonesia, Myanmar, and New Zealand. And when President Obama visited Australia, an agreement was reached to build yet another U.S. base there for 2,500 more Marines, whose primary mission will be to reinforce U.S. power in the Indian Ocean and the critically important Malacca Strait. And recall that the first state visit of the Obama administration was by Prime Minister Singh of India. During that summit, President Obama described the U.S.-Indian relationship as a defining relationship for the 21st century, primarily because of India's role in encircling China. Add to that the likely continued presence of U.S. forces in Afghanistan, and China is completely encircled except from the north. And this, along with NATO's expansion, helps to explain the deepening ties between Beijing and Moscow. People in the U.S. and in an increasing number of other countries are working to decrease military spending, but it is the competition with China, along with pressures from the military-industrial complex, that are driving much of the staggering levels of U.S. military spending. One example is the $1.5 trillion to be spent for the nuclear-capable F-35 fighter-bomber. A new military doctrine, air-sea battle, has been developed for possible war against China. It doesn't envision U.S. troops on the ground and body bags coming home. Instead, it is designed to threaten the destruction of much of China from the sea, air, space, and likely cyberspace. Added to this is the campaign to negotiate a Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement, often described as NAFTA on steroids. In addition to giving multinational corporations enormous power to circumvent governmental regulations that are designed to serve and protect people, TPP is also designed to further integrate Asian Pacific societies, not only their economies, into the U.S., the goal being to limit their engagements with China. U.S. is also engaged in negotiating a U.S.-European Union free trade agreement. As Sergei Rogov of the USA and Canada Institute in Moscow explains, if they are successful, these agreements will place the U.S. at the head of an enormous and interconnected set of economic blocks, greatly increasing U.S. leverage over China and ensuring U.S. leadership in a polycentric system of international relations. All of this is not being quietly accepted across Asia and the Pacific. There are powerful and broad Okinawan, Korean, and Philippine popular actions of resistance. And remember that Obama did not return from his recent trip to Tokyo with an agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership. There is powerful opposition to TPP in many countries. There is a wide array of alternatives to U.S. Asia-Pacific policies. I believe that were we to return to common security, the paradigm that served to end the Cold War, we could greatly reduce the dangers of war in Asia and the Pacific and begin building peace systems for the longer term. Common security does not provide us everything we need, but it promises a much more peaceful paradigm. In conclusion, there are two points I want to stress. First, the situation in East Asia has powerful and dangerous parallels to 1914 in Europe. Second, we all need to become much more literate about the histories and political dynamics of Asia and the Pacific, as well as about how the pivot is being implemented. We need to do this if we are to exercise people's power to prevent catastrophic, potentially nuclear, great power war.